Well, I am delighted to welcome the Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University, Professor Louise Richardson, to Talking Philanthropy. Between 2004 and 2019, the Oxford Thinking Campaign raised over three billion pounds in philanthropic donations from more than 170,000 donors. At the beginning of this year, Oxford University received a $100 million gift to create a new research institute to fight antimicrobial resistance, one of the biggest health threats of our time. I also think uh, congratulations are in order to the researchers at Oxford University for their incredible success developing the COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, Professor Richardson, thank you for agreeing uh, to talk to us. Perhaps you can maybe uh, talk us through the role that philanthropy plays in enabling and strengthening research at the university. Good morning, Kirsty. Well, actually, philanthropy is critical to everything we do. Um, but on the research front, um, our medical sciences division, which is our largest division, really wouldn't be what it is today without extraordinarily generous support from funders like the Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, major charities. One of the challenges we face is that charities don't cover the full economic cost of research, so we rely on government to make up the difference. So that gap has been growing. So we have the, the major uh, philanthropic uh, charities, and then we have individual uh, individual philanthropists. You mentioned the uh, Ineos gift. That would be one example. Um, but we have, um, as a publicly funded institution, we rely on public support. But really, I see philanthropy as providing the margin of excellence. Uh, unlike our American competitors, we don't have the vast endowments. Yes, it's terrific that we raised three billion pounds, but it took us a long time to do it. I'm hoping we'd raise the next three billion in much shorter order. I'm hoping that we can change the culture around educational philanthropy uh, in this country, particularly. So I would say that Oxford would not be the institution it is without the generous support of philanthropists. And that's as true today as it was historically. I mean, if one looks around this wonderful uh, city and these dreaming spars. I mean, many of the colleges have the names of donors who, who uh, established them. So philanthropy isn't something new. Um, Oxford has been built by philanthropists throughout the ages. And what role, uh, if any, did philanthropy play in, in funding the development of the, of the COVID vaccine? Well, uh, the backdrop would be that, as I say, the medical sciences division is, is very dependent on, on philanthropic support. The actual vaccine itself um, was based on work that had been carried out for about 20 years in the Jenner Institute with collaborators in, in Kenya, in Thailand, and so on. Um, but once it became clear that we felt we were onto something, we created a, a rapid uh, research fund and invited philanthropic support. And uh, philanthropists um, were enormously generous in rushing in to help. So, um, so they made everything so much easier. We, I, I would say that back in January of last year, when the head of the medical sciences division came to see me, he said, you know, a couple of people in the Jenner think they might really be onto something, but they have absolutely no funding and they operate on the shoestring. So could we find a million pounds to underwrite what they do? Um, so the university provided the million pounds, confident that if this worked, we would be able to recoup it, which, which we could do. Uh, but philanthropists stepped in to um, endow the posts of the main um, researchers uh, to help uh, fund the small manufacturing facility, because again, we had to suddenly had to operate in a world we weren't entirely accustomed to uh, until we uh, uh, got a, a major partner. I would also say a, a, a major uh, charitable organization like the Gates Foundation was also critical. I mean, they offered us advice when we decided that we really thought this might work, but that we were not going to be able to manufacture it and distribute it at scale. Uh, and we turned to them for advice. So philanthropists were, were all over the development of the vaccine uh, and still are. One of the things that we're talking about uh, uh, during uh, talking to philanthropy is, is the interface between philanthropists, government and uh, universities, how they can work together, if you like, to, to develop a, a stronger 
uh, ecosystem. Uh, I, I mean, have you got any thoughts uh, on that? Well, yes, indeed. I mean, the major charitable, charitable organisations in the UK, again, have very close links to government. Again, I would turn to Wellcome Trust uh, being the main one, but, but also Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation and so on. Um, they have very close ties to government. And certainly when we were uh, found ourselves in a position where we thought we might be onto something, um, but without the means to turn it into a distributable vaccine. In fact, just last week, we celebrated the first anniversary from uh, the first injection into a human arm. So we went from one to a quarter of a billion in one year, which is really unprecedented. We couldn't have done that without the support of the government, without the support of philanthropists. So I think um, this is a mutually reinforcing ecosystem we all have to invest in it government can facilitate it greatly i mean they can do that by uh well the obvious way i suppose is by tax uh, devising a tax system that provides incentives um to charities or indeed to um the charitable arms of, of private industry to to invest in universities but i think what this pandemic has demonstrated is just the power of um, research universities to contribute to society at large. I mean, too often people think of universities as a place where you send 18 year olds to go off and grow up for a few years, but actually we are research powerhouses or some of us are. We're critical to the uh, to national health, wealth and well-being. And um, philanthropists can, can help us translate the research that we do into broader societal benefit. And how do you think philanthropists can help or support a pandemic preparedness or indeed, you know, the other future health crises coming down the line? Well, I very much hope uh, they can and they will. Certainly one of my ambitions or Oxford's ambitions is to create a center for pandemic preparedness here in Oxford. And we're very much hoping that we will be able to persuade both the government and philanthropists to create it here, to use, to bring together the international collaborators we have who've worked together, to bring together all the research we've done, not just on the vaccine, but um, you know, we ran these recovery trials, which are the largest trials in the world for therapeutics for uh, COVID-19. And it was through this trial that we discovered the efficacy of dexamethasone, which is a very cheap steroid Commoner Garden steroid costs five pounds that dramatically reduces mortality. Same thing with toxilizumab, which is a, an arthritis drug. Again, huge efficacy uh, for those hospitalized. So um, these are really important contributions. We want to bring them all together so that next time we're prepared and, and there will be a next time. I mean, the, the great tragedy really is that there were eight near misses over the last 20 years. It, you know, people in the know knew it was inevitable that there would be a major pandemic uh, and predicted it. And yet we were caught unprepared and we, we just can't afford to let that happen again. So I very much hope that philanthropists will, will help us at Oxford create a really a world leading center for pandemic preparedness, but also in, invest in the work uh, throughout the world as well. And, where, would and I, the biggest, where, would you, where would you say the biggest gaps in funding are right now? Oh, there are gaps across the piece. I mean, universities are very expensive institutions to run. I think our one of our priorities at the moment is to create a center for pandemic preparedness, and that's a very expensive operation. We will need several hundred million pounds uh, to create the center we have the plans for. So we are hoping that we will get support from government, from private philanthropists, from industry, from research councils, uh, and so on. Um, but I'm afraid there are gaps everywhere, largely, as I said, because of our dependence on foundations and the fact that foundations don't pay the full economic cost. It's that gap. Um, you know, Oxford actually loses money on every research grant it accepts. So that's, you know, that's unsustainable over the long term. It's certainly unsustainable if we want to remain globally competitive and amongst the best institutions in the world as we are now, again, competing with institutions in Asia, which have far greater public support, or institutions in America, which have far greater uh, philanthropic support. Just want to circle back actually to that point that you made about how critical it was both to have government support, but also philanthropic support for the development of, 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 of the vaccine. 
there are obviously different models all over the world. I know in Singapore, for instance, there is the, the, the government provides matched funding or more than matched funding, one and a half uh, times for a, a, a grant for every philanthropic donation. Uh, I mean, in your view, what is, what, what is the best model for this when you look around the world? Um, well, I mean, we have the QR model, which is the model in which the government makes up the difference between charitable and, and um, funding and the actual cost. I mean, that's a model that works. It, it's not working at the moment because the government has, has been declining uh, its contribution, decreasing its contribution every year. I think there are many models that work. We would love a matched funding approach, but we recognize that in these times, there's many demands on government funding, and this has been unprecedented times. So, uh, but the current model we have, it works, it's just underfunded. Um, and, you know, we've had the really unfortunate cut in the overseas aid budget, which has had a real effect on, on um, over funding, on philanthropic funding overseas, on our projects overseas. So we would hope that you know, that would be reversed very quickly. And uh, that both, that they, you know, society appreciates just the importance of investing in universities, not um, uh, for societal benefit. As I say, we, we really are the engines of the economy and we've demonstrated in this instance how, how flexible we can be um, to adapt <clears throat> as we did in this case. And I think one of the advantages of a, of an institution like Oxford, it's one of the reasons it makes my job so difficult is that uh, there's a great deal of local autonomy. So people can turn on a dime. So what happened in our medical sciences division and in our uh, materials, uh, uh, our sciences across the board, people just stopped what they were doing and said, what do I do that could be helpful in this pandemic? And they turned their research around and they had the latitude to do that. And so, um, managed to make contributions all across the piece. But, um, but we do operate on a, on a shoestring compared to many of our competitors. And so that's what we've got to change if we're to be globally competitive. So presumably this $100 million gift that uh, Oxford has got to create this new institute to fight antimicrobial anti uh, resistance mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 is absolutely key. Is, is that a good example, would you say, of how philanthropy can can support research. That's a wonderful example and it's actually 100 million pounds so it's even more generous uh, from uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe and and it's interesting in a couple of respects. We've we've had three major gifts in the last three years. Um, 100 million pounds from INEOS for antimicrobial resistance and that is just going to fund research and that's a wonderful alignment of the interests of an individual philanthropist and the interests of some academics. So and, and an issue of absolutely global importance to us all. One of the, um, well, one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is just the high cost of ignoring things that are probable and of high consequence. And rapidly, there were, we're developing resistance to antibiotics due to the overuse of antibiotics in agriculture and so on. So we have got to develop uh, um, either new antibiotics or probably both, reduce the dependence of uh, agriculture on antibiotics. If we don't, we're going to return to the days before penicillin when the simplest operation was, was life-threatening. Um, we developed penicillin here in Oxford in the, in the late 1930s, so we're delighted to be at the vanguard of, of um, advancing uh, uh, or handling the problem of, of antimicrobial resistance. So this was an issue that uh, Jim Ratcliffe learned about, I think after surgery on his knee um, and got to know about the work we were doing. So the academics and the philanthropists got together. So what he's doing, he's just funding research. This is people, it's not buildings. This is not a vanity project. This is funding people in labs doing research. And if they're successful, the whole world is going to benefit. Now that's quite diff different from the major gift we got last year from the Rubin Foundation they gave us 80 million pounds to establish a new Oxford College, first Oxford, new Ox Oxford College in decades. And that's because we have many more students wanting to come as graduate students to study in the sciences. Our colleges are pretty full. We believe in a highly personalized educational system. So we don't want the colleges to grow. So we decided to create a new college. And so the Rubens have enabled us to do that. 
and just to remind everyone that it isn't only science that matters. I mean, the humanities are vitally important too. And um, so the previous year, we um, received a gift of 150 million pounds from Stephen Schwartzman to create uh, a new center for the humanities at Oxford. And I'm enormously excited about this gift because not only is it going to bring all our, our humanities faculties together, it's going to create a, a performing arts center. We're going to have a concert hall and theaters that the public can come into. And thirdly, we're going to take the um, insights of a millennium of studying the humanities and apply them to the problems of the future. So we're going to have an institute for the ethics of AI. So we hear about AI all day, every day. Some of us know how it works, most of us don't, but we know it's becoming increasingly important. And yet we want to make sure that the people who are developing these machines, who are writing the codes, think about the ethics of what they're doing. We want to make sure that governments can come to to academics for advice on how to regulate AI, that um, industries who use AI think about the ethical implications of what they're doing. So this is a real way of fusing what we have historically done, the humanities, with the future. And it's only possible because of this extraordinary generous gift. So there are three very large but very different gifts in the past three years. So if I was a philanthropist and I wanted to make a, a, a gift of, of an equivalent size uh, to, to that, and, uh, another 100 million pounds, oh, and, and I came to chat with you, where would you direct that money to? Where would you say it was most needed? Well, I would have a view on that, um, but I think if I were to be a successful fundraiser, I would have to find out what your priorities are. What things interest you? Is it climate change? Is it access for poor students? Is it pandemic preparedness? Um, I think the secret of philanthropy is aligning uh, the interests of the philanthropist with the kind of expertise of the institution. So rather than try to direct you to my pet project, which would you know, probably be the center for pandemic preparedness at the moment, I am, um, and, and I think I would take the trouble to find out what you really cared about. And if you really cared about climate change, I would direct you towards our academics working in that area. So I do think it's, it's, institutions shouldn't selfishly think these are my needs, Who, who's going to help me deal with them? I think we should go out and find out what are the interests of people with the means to contribute and um, try to align our activities or ensure that or join them up with our activities that align with their interests. Now, as you've said, uh, Oxford is uh, a global university. It, uh, it cooperates globally. Lots of the research depends uh, on that. What is Oxford doing uh, in terms of uh, working with the global south and how does philanthropy support uh, that work? Uh, and, and also, you know, because I'm just thinking about the context that you mentioned of the British government cutting the overseas aid budgets. Presumably that means there's a little bit of a gap there. There's a real gap there. We've had 68% cuts in several of our absolutely wonderful projects uh, in, in the developing world. Um, one of the things, well, as I said, the fact that we were in a position to develop this vaccine so quickly was based on the fact that for 20 years, we, we have about uh, 1,500 researchers in, in, in uh, Kenya, Thailand, um, Vietnam, working on in, infectious diseases. So, um, you know, we need support for that work. It's critically important. And it isn't just about uh, a distant part of the world. It's vital to what we do here. I would also say that when we uh, did trials for our, the early trials for our vaccine, we did them here in the UK. But at the time, the, the COVID wasn't very rampant. So we also ran trials in Brazil. We also ran trials in South Africa. So we are deeply international institution. And um, so that means philanthropists from all over the world have a, are more likely to have an interest in what we do. Um, and, and there's just such a glaring need. But um, thankfully, there are many generous philanthropists and, and universities do a wide uh, variety of things. So the whole um, game is, the, the whole project, as I say, is to align um, the interests of both but certainly uh, we're seeing we will see if, if we don't um, if we don't 
share our vaccines more generously than we have until now, we're going to see, we're, we're, we're going to pay the cost of this. I, I, the one point I would like to make about our vaccine, which I think wouldn't have happened had it not been developed in a university. When we went looking for an, a, an industry partner, we had two conditions. One was that this vaccine be distributed at cost in perpetuity in the developing world. Um, and second, that we would not be party to profiteering during a pandemic. So the vaccine had to be distributed at cost um, during the pandemic. So frankly, I don't think AstraZeneca has gotten the credit they deserve at all for doing that. Um, and so we need to put pressure on the other manufacturers to provide the Global South with, uh, with the vaccine too. Well, can I just say that personally, as a recipient of the Oxford vaccine, now double vaccinated, I'm extremely grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just finally, uh, Professor Richardson, do you think the pandemic will bring about a shift, or maybe it's already bringing about a shift in, 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 in philanthropic giving? Do you think we're now going to see a, a lot more. I mean, we 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 know that the numbers of wealthy people in the world are, has has grown. Uh, are they going? Are those families and those foundations going to step up to the plate? Do you think more? I really hope so. Um, I mean, if if I were one of those people with all this money, I, what do you want to do with that money? Surely you want to have an impact, and you want to make the world a better place. And I think through the pandemic, we have demonstrated just what wonderful vehicles for that universities are. I mean, our, our, our research profile has never been higher, but we have moved both in the US and in the UK. There's been this culture over the past few years that you know, we've had enough of experts. Well, now nobody can get enough of experts. You know, people want to hear from professors. They want to hear from the experts. And so I think philanthropists will say, Yes, they want to support the people who are doing this work. But I think, um, you know, philanthropists quite rightly have real conditions to their philanthropy. They're going to want to see it not just reside within the university, but to be translated for a societal effect. I think they're enti entirely within their rights to insist on that. Uh, and I think it's a condition we can meet. But I really hope that philanthropists will see that um, supporting education is the best possible use of their funds. Professor Louise Richardson, Vice Chancellor of Oxford University, thank you uh, for taking part in Talking Philanthropy. My pleasure. Thank you, Kirsty.